in. Let's dive in, starting with our highly anticipated keynote. She's a leader in customer experience and a highly sought after presenter for global conferences and events. She's a frequent contributor to Forbes, the Harvard Business Review, and Hemisphere Magazine. She has deep expertise in improving customer experience and differentiating yourself in a competitive marketplace. She provides practical examples that you can immediately implement at your company to improve customer relationships, drive and drive growth, and you can do it all with a toll-free number. Please join me in welcoming Blake Morgan. Thank you. Good morning. Today I'm here to talk about the power of customer experience, but first, I want to talk about football. <laughs> Do I have any football fans out there? Any Eagles fans? Okay, I understand if you don't like the Eagles, but that was really, really mean. You're like, no. <laughs> You must, hate, you must hate us. I saw one guy. Thank you for raising your... Thank you. So in my family, the Eagles are a really big deal. My dad would be an amazing, in an amazing mood on a Sunday if the Eagles won. But if the Eagles lost, we all knew to avoid my dad the whole day, right? Did you have parents like this or are you like this? And so my whole family was so excited this year because the Eagles made it all the way to the Super Bowl. And that never happens. My dad's always in a bad mood about the Eagles, and he says they stink with his Philadelphia accent. So this year, we were so excited the Eagles made it to the Super Bowl. We were so excited we decided to throw a party. And so we wore our green outfits. This is me and my husband getting ready for the game, and we actually invited all of our neighbors and friends, even our neighbors who are huge Patriots fans from Boston, and we trolled them with this Eagles cake. You guys, we got them an Eagles cake, and they're Patriots fans. Don't you see <laughs> what trolls we are? We even went on Amazon and bought our daughter an Eagles onesie. And there was only one for some reason, and it had horrible grammar. Did any of you catch that? Yeah. Right? I'm an Eagles fan. But anyway, we're all really excited. We got the beer, we got the snacks, the fixings, the nachos, and we're watching the game, and it's going pretty well. Everyone's getting very excited when the Eagles make a good pass, and then when the Eagles fumble, we're crying, except for my neighbors who are Patriots fans, but... And we get to the halftime show of the Super Bowl, which is my personal favorite part because I love music and I love dance. And this year, Justin Timberlake was performing. And if any of you have toddlers like I do, you probably know the Trolls movie. Do any of you know the Trolls movie and the Trolls soundtrack? It's actually really good. And so I was really excited about this performance. And we see Justin come on and he starts playing some of his music. My daughter's moving her baby feet and shimmying. She's only two. Husband's clapping. But then, but then the cable cuts out. The cable cuts out. And all of my guests are looking at me like, Blake, do something. So like a football player, I leap for my cell phone and I grab that thing and I fumble to get the 1-800 number together for 1-800 cable. <laughs> and for the next 10 minutes, I find myself in phone tree hell. And everyone is staring at me as I try and fix this with the phone tree. Kind of like right now, actually. Everyone's staring at me. And of course, the IVR doesn't know who I am and 
tries to verify who are you, what is your customer number. Of course I don't have that on hand. And so we go back and forth and back and forth and finally I get an agent on the phone who makes me go through all of it again. Who are you? What's your customer number? Of course, we're missing Justin and we know it and so everyone is just losing their mind. We're missing the show. And so after about 10 minutes of back and forth, going through the technical customer service issue with me, and I've got the guy on speaker, the agent, because to be honest, my husband's more of the IT guy in the house. And so we finally get the cable going again. But at this point, the show is over. And while the Eagles won the Super Bowl, haha, ha, all of you Eagles haters out there, I won't ever forget that my daughter and I missed our halftime show dance because our cable cut out and then I was stuck in phone tree hell. Everybody in this room here is a customer and we all know what it feels like to have a poor customer experience. I'm sure if I asked any of you here if you can recall a recent customer service nightmare, you would all raise your hands and gladly tell me something that happened in probably the last week. But I see the phone as actually a huge branding and relationship building opportunity. As Gina said, an opportunity to do more, to step up for the customer. And what's amazing is that even with the emergence of technology, the phone still serves as the go-to channel when something goes wrong in our lives. When my cable cut out for the Eagles show, for the Eagles game, I wasn't sending a tweet, and I'm a big social media user. No, I wanted someone on the phone now. And so the 1-800 number is truly ubiquitous. Everybody has one. And if you think of the 1-800 number, it's really like the front door to the house of your business. And that first impression of the customer standing on the porch of the house really matters. What's happening at the front door? When you or your agent opens the door, what does the customer see? Do they hear 100 agents in the family room? Does it look organized or does it look like a mess? Your house matters. And when the customer can't get through to you through the front door, customers lose their mind. They might start running around the side of the house and scaling up to the windows. And imagine if the front door is the 1-800 number, the side doors are Twitter and Facebook and social media and blogs. Everybody has a 1-800 number. And it truly is a huge brand building and marketing opportunity, but not every company sees that. And I had a lot of fun actually preparing to come speak to you. I was doing quite a bit of research about toll-free and 1-800. And so I started looking at vanity numbers, and I started looking at some of the more quirky 1-800 numbers, like 1-800-GIANT-MEN. How many of you think you know what this is? <laughs> It's not what you think. <laughs> Turns out if you're moving, giant men are really helpful. And if 1-800 giant men is plastered to the side of a truck, oh, you're going to remember that number for sure. 1-800 junk USA. Turns out moving companies have quite a sense of humor, and they really get this toll-free thing. So if you want some college hunks to help you move, call 1-800 junk USA. I told you 1-800 numbers are ubiquitous. Even Bill Murray, one of my favorite actors, had one because he was so sick of getting calls from his agent that he set up a 1-800 number so nobody would bother him because Bill Murray, like some terrible companies we know, never answered his 1-800 number. And as a result, he lost out on so many major movie and TV roles, so it was 1-800 his loss. And I believe that the phone is truly the front door of the house. It's an opportunity to be there for the customer at an emotional point of need. When that customer is in their family room with all their friends and their daughter who's two and listening to Justin Timberlake and the phone and the TV cuts out, that was an opportunity for my cable company to step up. But they didn't.
And so sometimes when it comes to business and customer experience, it seems like we need a very public wake-up call to force us to do better. And so I'd like to play for you a brief clip of an eight-minute call that was the wake-up call for Comcast when things went awry. Okay. If we don't know why our customers are leaving, how are we supposed to make it a better experience for you next time? Okay. When a sound turns out to have... That's, that's, a, that's, a fantastic, that's a fantastic question and something that you can hire a firm to go figure out. For right now, I'm just a customer calling in, attempting to disconnect service. That is something that you can do, right? You said that you can't disconnect service. Yes? Yes? Is, is that something you can do? Is that something you can do? Can you disconnect us by phone? Can you disconnect our service? Yes or no? Was that cringeworthy for you? Oh, I can play the whole call. It's eight minutes. It's absolutely painful. And so Ryan Block was trying to cancel his service. But unfortunately, the agent at Comcast wasn't going to let him go because he was trying to meet a sales quota. And because he was so focused on this KPI, this performance metric to earn his wages, he forgot that Ryan Block is a customer, is a person with feelings, and you can hear it in Ryan's voice, can't you? We've all sounded like that at some point. Just, I just can't believe this. This is horrible. And this audio got 7 million downloads or more. 7 million. And it was one in a string of embarrassing public customer service blunders for Comcast. And so the executive team got together and they're like, this is bad. This is bad. This is embarrassing. We have to do something. This is not acceptable. And so Comcast really decided to step up to level up their customer experience game and do better. And you can read all about it on the web. A recent interview with one of their senior customer service executives, Tom Karinchak, said, hey, we got to do better. We're going to look at culture. We're going to look at training, systems, processes, technology, and tools. Because we need to really go through some kind of audit to find out where did this go wrong? Why does this agent feel like it's acceptable to harass this customer, Ryan, that this is an OK way to be? And so Comcast grew its digital team, did about a million social customer service interactions in the last year. And you've probably heard their ads on the radio where they tell customers, we are committing to you. We want to do better, and we are working on it. And I think there's something very redeeming for a company that goes through an embarrassing public nightmare like this and actually says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We, it was our bad. We're going to fix it. And we like Comcast better for it. But other companies started from the get-go with this idea that customer centricity is a powerful differentiating tool. And one of those companies is based right here in Vegas, and they're called Zappos. And Zappos, from the beginning, saw the phone as an amazing branding and relationship-building opportunity. And they've been talking about customer experience for over 10 years. I got to interview Tony Shea in person like nine years ago. And he was drinking the Kool-Aid. And the longest call at Zappos with a customer, between an agent and a customer, was actually over 10 hours long. So I'm going to play the 10-hour call for you right now. <laughs> Is that all right? No, I'm not. But I'm going to play a short clip because I like the way it illustrates this idea of customer centricity. My name is Steve Weinstein, and I'm in the Zappo CLT department. The call that I took was actually 10 hours and 43 minutes. I remember the customer stating that she'd like to place an order. After we had placed the order, the business part was over. And then the connection just got even stronger. 
We talked about everything from vacations to restaurants to places we've been to. But see, that's the coolest thing about Zappos. You can talk to the customers. The customers become your friends. And this was amazing. She said, I've never been treated like this by any company anywhere ever before. And that's what we do here at Zappos. It's that obsession with making sure our customers are perfectly happy. We care about the customers. We welcome them to the Zappos family. And I'm not just saying this because I work here. Zappos by far has the super nicest and best customers ever, hands down. Isn't Steven just sweet and sincere? Don't you want to work with him or give him a hug? So my question is, what is the difference between the management style of the company that has an agent, like we heard earlier, versus this one? What empowers and enables Steven to be so genuine on the phone, to actually work a long day just to make someone feel good? Because this is not a transaction for him. Clearly, he feels almost like spiritually connected to his job and what he's doing. And he has this purpose, which I think is really beautiful and truly shows how powerful customer experience can be. But you have to get it, and you have to embrace it in your company culture. But I think in the last 30 years, we've been talking about technology today. We'll talk about technology more. We've gotten a bit over excited about contact center technology. We, saw, we thought, wow, we're going to save so much money, this IVR phone tree thing. But the thing is, we've sort of gotten ahead of ourselves, and we've lost sight that the phone is truly this powerful tool that we're not taking advantage of in the way that we could. But I think the phone as a device, we've really overlooked for many, many years. Even in 1876, this is a photo of Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the phone. He actually tried to sell his patent in 1876 for $100,000 to Western Union. It's a pretty good deal. But they laughed in his face. The committee that was reviewing this product from Alexander said, this idea is idiotic on the face of it. It is an ungainly and impractical device. They basically said, why would you use this when you can send a telegraph through a messenger on foot? Mind you, telegraphs use Morse code. Of course, Morse code versus a phone call. And he said, we do not recommend this product. Bet that guy is really rolling over in his grave right now. The thing is, customer service has sort of a bad rap. And all of us in this room have gone through the craziest stuff when it comes to customer service. You can't escape it. Because in life, stuff breaks. And when stuff breaks, we've got to fix it. And so even my husband and I, we have these customer service interactions. And we say to each other, wow, you just can't make this stuff up. It's like an episode out of Seinfeld. And so to illustrate my point about customer service, the phone tree, and IVR, who better than to help me than Seinfeld? Hello, and welcome to Movie Phone. If you know the name of the movie you'd like to see, press 1. Come on, come on. Using your touchstone keypad, please enter the first three letters of the movie title now. You've selected Agent Zero. <laughs> If that's correct, press 1. What? Uh, you've selected brown-eyed girl. If this is correct, press 1. Why don't you just tell me the name of the movie you selected? Channel? To find the theater nearest you, please enter your five-digit zip code now. Why don't you just tell me where you want to see the movie? I love George's face in this, because we've all been there. Because IVRs and phone tree, we haven't really taken advantage. We have all this amazing technology that we're using, even in our personal lives. Like, how many of you watched Netflix last night? 
or went to the gym this morning and used a Spotify playlist. None of you went to the gym this morning? You're all, I did party with you last night, but I mean, come on, one guy. Okay, I didn't see you there. But the, the interesting thing about contact center agents is we're very afraid of this discussion of robotics. But at the same time, for years, we've been treating our employees like robots, and they sound like robots, like Kramer with this script. And so I believe that the opportunity now is to have a blend of human and technology together, where we don't treat our people like robots, where we allow them to be human beings. And we're going to talk a little bit about technology now and look toward the future of technology. But actually, if you want to think about the future of technology, the best thing to do is actually look back into the past. Did any of you watch Inspector Gadget growing up? Do, 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 do. Okay. And so Peggy from Inspector Gadget had the first smartwatch, iWatch, right? No? And so increasingly, technology is part of all of our lives, and it makes our lives easier and better, which is why we love it so much. If any of you have a car from General Motors, you might have OnStar, where the agent is almost embedded in the car. So you press a button, and you get to an agent who can give you directions, tell you where the nearest Starbucks is, or if you've been in an accident, they can help you. And so this is the future where we literally have help embedded in our products and services. In fact, Samsung has a fridge that is smart, that is IoT enabled, that is connected to the internet. So we can get our Gmail on there, we can listen to music on Spotify. If you have a toddler still who has a Nest Cam, you can look at the Nest Cam and see if your toddler's awake yet. And so increasingly, all our products and services will be connected to each other in the internet. And we'll be sending data to your companies, and your companies will be sending data to the customer. And so we have to think about how will that evolve the way we offer services to customers, the way we offer even phone service. Because right now, if I have this fridge and something's broken, I might call the agent directly through the fridge. And let's say my fridge is connected to my dishwasher, but it's different companies. What if I were to call the agent through the fridge and then call the agent from the IoT dishwasher-enabled product and get them talking to each other to troubleshoot with each other? Pretty crazy, right? I'm blowing your mind right now. <laughs> and virtual and augmented reality are becoming increasingly good, where we can actually experience things remotely without having to be there. And this is really interesting from a customer service perspective. Because remember that Eagles game I told you about where I was fumbling around with my cable? If I had virtual reality glasses on, I could have had the agent swap into my view so he could see what I was looking at. Or maybe the agent had a room set up with my product displayed, and I could swap into his or her view, and they could show me, here's how you fix your TV. And so this is actually beautiful when it comes to service because we'll have so much more of an ability to see what the customer sees, to train the customer, to even train our agents. And so virtual and augmented reality should all be something that you're paying attention to as you think about the future of your business. And talking about the smart home, in the future, some predict that communication will be ubiquitous, that our homes will be full of screens where we're actually cooking breakfast in the morning and we're reading the news or getting a recipe or calling grandma on the phone or in the bathroom mirror we're flossing our teeth at night and our spouse isn't home yet and so we call our spouse on the bathroom mirror and say honey where are you you could think of how an agent could talk to a customer in their bathroom but I don't know what they'd be talking about maybe a makeup tutorial I would do that and so Gina introduced this idea of more is more, because what does more mean? Is it just more services and products? No. It's really about being thoughtful. How thoughtful are we when we think about what the customer is actually going through? And so it's not about more, more products or services. It's simply about being more thoughtful and more empathetic to think, what does it actually feel like to be a customer? 
And so a few years ago, when I really started digging into this topic of customer experience, I was pretty disappointed because I found that a lot of the thought leaders and the people who were talking about this use the phrase customer service interchangeably with customer experience. But if you think about it, that really doesn't make sense because customer service is who you call when something breaks. Now, customer experience can be shaped by so much more. How is the product built? Who is building that product? Who is hiring the people that built that product? And so it's much broader and deeper than simply customer service and the contact center. So in my book, I broke customer experience down into six parts. And you're all getting a copy of the book right after I'm done. And the six parts are much more than customer service. The first is, how, you, how do you design your product? The second is, how do you manage your people? Do you have a culture where you have employees like Steven, who are empowered to actually do something for the customer and sit on the phone for 10 hours? In the contact center, what is the vibe like? Have you ever been in your contact center? Raise your hand. OK, about a fourth of the room. Would highly encourage you to go check out your contact center. You will learn so much. But what is it like for the employees working in the contact center? Do they have access to fresh air outside? Do they have natural light? Or is it a 1,000 people all sitting on top of each other? Customers can hear, each, hear all of the agents in the background. You could imagine. And so we'll talk more about employee experience in a little bit. Here's my favorite. How are we modernizing with technology? Because technology isn't everything, but if you think of Today's most beloved brands like Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, these are all companies that have used technology to differentiate their offering. So technology isn't everything, but increasingly, it plays a huge role in shaping both the employee and the customer experience. Fourth, we've got culture, because culture proves to be really big. Do the executives care about what's happening on the ground, in the factory floor, in the call centers? Do they know what's going on? And is that culture of customer centricity flowing down into the floor, onto the phones? And you can tell. And fifth is governance, because you can't improve something unless you measure it. Like, think of in your own lives. If you want to save money, you've got to see where your money's going. If you want to lose weight, you have to see what you're eating and what, uh, where your calories are going. And so if we can't measure it, we can't improve it. And so when we think about what are the KPIs that we're measuring our employees by, they really matter. What are the KPIs? And how are we creating this governance? And are we thinking about what is a customer experience metric? And so I don't believe that it's just contact center employees that should be held to customer experience metrics. I think it's everybody. Because if you think about it, everybody touches the customer in some way. And six, how do we embrace disruption and innovation? How do we embrace disruption and innovation? And so we're going to break down these six areas and give you some examples. And then we're going to look at a case study to illustrate the point. How many of you watch Netflix? Right, almost everyone. <clears throat> I wrote a post on Forbes that I think Netflix will be bigger than Disney one day. That got a lot of people angry. I like getting people angry online. Anyway, um, the reason is Netflix is incredibly customer focused. They are customer focused with their algorithm. So how do you personally find 40 shows that are relevant for only you? And they're customer focused in how they build out and design their products. For example, they just announced that now, if you watch the show Black Mirror, which is a futurist show, did any of you watch this? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's creepy. You guys are creepy. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> My husband loves this show. I like it, but it's, it's a bit much. Anyway, now you, fans of the show, can have a hand at actually ending the show, kind of like choose your own adventure. So you can literally tell Netflix how you'd like to see the show end, and they're going to produce that. That's pretty incredible. And there's a lot of customer-centric companies that build with the customer in mind. For example, Slack is a really great software program for work. But it started as a gaming company. But they realized 
wow, you know, people are really using this for work to replace email because email is kind of terrible. And so every iteration of their product, they incorporated customer feedback. And now they have millions and millions of customers. And they didn't have marketing at the beginning. They simply built a really customer-focused product that people love and talk about. And now Slack is worth $5 billion. Do any of you use Slack at work instead of email? Wow, that's awesome. What are you guys saying? You're all saying, Michelle, you can tell me after what you're saying of the book signing. You have something to tell me about this. So product design is key. Employee experience proves to be hugely important when it comes to how your customers feel. Makes sense, right? Because if you personally are tired, you don't feel fresh, you don't like your boss, you don't have the tools you need to do your job, that customer experience is definitely going to suffer. And lucky for me, my husband actually wrote a book about employee experience, and it's called The Employee Experience Advantage, Jacob Morgan. And he also felt like this area really wasn't well-defined, kind of like I felt about customer experience. So he decided to break it down into three easy-to-understand parts, culture, technology, and physical space. Culture proves to be a really hard nut to crack. It's difficult. In fact, if I were to ask all of you individually what does culture mean, you probably would all tell me something really different. Turns out it's also really hard for managers to implement. The second area is technology. Because employees today are also just like you using Netflix, Spotify, maybe you bought something on Amazon on your phone right now while I'm talking. So we all have this amazing consumer-grade technology we're using in our personal lives, and then we go to work, and we're in software or hardware hell at work. And so we, we have to know that technology plays a huge role in the experience of the employee and the employee's ability to block and tackle for the customer. And I'm pretty sure you're going to be hearing more about this today um, with some of the other speakers from Invoca and Google and so on and so forth. Physical space. We mentioned the contact center. What is the physical environment of employees? What is the it matters. You know personally, if you don't feel fresh, like you're in an environment where you can focus, your work is going to suffer. Culture, technology, and physical space. And the reason to invest in employee experience is it unlocks discretionary effort for employees. So, of course, if employees feel good, dancing like me to Justin Timberlake, enjoying themselves at work, like Steven from Zappos, they're going to work harder for the customer. And now we're seeing more research and stats that prove the ROI of these investments. Temkin Group recently put out a stat for a company with an annual revenue of a billion dollars. If they invest just a little bit in customer experience, over three years, they will earn an $830 million return. These are big numbers. And we talked about technology. Technology proves to be a huge differentiator for both employees and customers. Because our most beloved brands today use technology to make our lives easier and better. This is my playlist from Spotify. I'm amazed when I turn on Spotify when I'm working or exercising. Everything is so good. I don't have to switch the song because through the algorithm, they've gotten to know me so well that everything's already done for me. And this is the ideal customer experience of Spotify. I love this picture of Jeff B. He looks happy and confident, doesn't he? Jeff Bezos. So Jeff is interesting. He's the richest man on the, in the world, but he's not above sitting in the, on, in the call center on the phone. So you might call Amazon's contact center and you get Jeff because he trains in his contact center every year and he requires all of his senior executives to do the same. And so I ask you, would your executives go into the contact center? Do they know what's happening on the ground? You don't have to raise your hand. I wouldn't want your colleagues to judge you if you don't like your senior executives. Capital One is one of my favorite case studies because they have this surprise and delight culture based on this culture of kindness. Capital One has really grown in the last like 15 years as a bank, innovating and pivoting with the times. 
And they had this awesome approach to how they manage their employees. And I won't go into the whole story, but basically what you see here on the screen is an agent that listened to a customer who was crying. Her name's Christina, because Christina got dumped by her fiance. And when she wanted to move out, she had to buy furniture, her credit card was declined. Tanya from Capital One said, oh my gosh, that is so horrible. I'm gonna fix this for you, but you know what? I think you need to have some fun. I want you to go on a vacation. We're gonna pay for it. Christina couldn't believe it. Capital One, Tanya sent her on vacation, and this was the media storm heard around the world. You can't make this stuff up. If you invest in your employees, it unlocks discretionary effort so they can do special things for customers. And now, Tanya is a twice promoted senior manager in the heavy spend queue at Capital One, which apparently if you work for a credit card in the contact center, that's the, that's the sexy glamorous part, heavy spend queue. And so, six innovation. We talk about innovation like it's something we have to do when we're struggling. But my view on innovation is that it's something we should do when we're actually doing well. When we're growing, when we're having success, we have to stop and think, how can we continue to evolve, to pivot? How can we continue to grow? And I don't believe that it should be necessity that's the mother of invention. I think it's something you should do when things are going pretty good, even in your own lives. And so I encourage you later today to try this do more framework with your colleagues about your own company. Even if you sell contact center software, do it for yourself. I think you'll be surprised by what you find. And we're gonna close by looking at Lyft, which is a very customer focused company. And what I like about Lyft is that they really embrace this idea of customer experience, but they do it for their employees. In fact, they call drivers customers. They call employees customers. And this is a new trend I'm seeing more and more. And so what I also like about Lyft is they are a very technology-focused company, but they have this wonderful blend of the technology and the person. And if you talk to senior executives at Lyft, they really make decisions based on emotion and the heart. It sounds cheesy, but they really care about how people feel. And they see themselves as an experience company, not as a necessarily a ride-sharing service. They see themselves as an experienced company. And just like Jeff B., John Zimmer, and the other senior executives at Lyft actually spend time moonlighting as drivers. And now every employee at Lyft has to spend four hours every three months driving customers around. So they really want everyone to know what does it feel like to be a customer? And what does it feel like to be a driver? And I went on Glassdoor in preparation for this talk today because I really wanted to get a sense of honestly, well, if Lyft is such a great company, what are employees saying? Is it legitimate? And I found this review. I absolutely love how Lyft puts employees first. How many of you think that an employee at your company would put an anonymous review on Glassdoor saying, my company loves me? No, maybe? Yes. You're speaking, so maybe you can talk about it later. In your, you work for Somos. <laughs> Good job, Gina and team. And I also find Lyft interesting because when we think about customer journey, we talked about it this morning, Gina mentioned it, that we shouldn't just be solving for one transactional opportunity. We have to solve for the entire customer experience. And what does that mean when we think about data and how we look at data and how we examine how is everything connected? Because if you think about it, the company is like a body and everything is connected. All of the organs are connected. So when one thing breaks down, it affects something else. So how are we solving for the entire journey and not just one transactional opportunity? I talk to Mary a lot, who's the head of customer experience and trust. I love that, because when you get into the backseat of an Uber or Lyft, it's a little scary. You have your life in someone's hands. There's always that moment when they lock the doors. Like yesterday, I was coming here from the airport, they locked the doors. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess there's a reason they need to lock all the doors. 
I know all of you paranoid people are laughing with me because you get, you get it. But she, Mary gets that. It's scary to get into a car with someone. So they're looking at emotion. They're thinking about, did a customer leave their purse in a car or a phone? That customer is definitely getting a phone call. And they're getting a phone call from somebody good. They're not getting an email or a tweet. They are getting a... Just kidding. They're getting a phone call. And so, again, Lyft, big company, high velocity, huge, huge growth. 10% ride-sharing increase in the last few years because of their approach to all of these things. Focuses on emotion, makes decisions based on heart and emotion. When do we do that in business? Not that often. And they're obsessed with feedback. I know they look at a lot of customer service metrics, like net promoter score. They're looking at in the contact center, which is now based in Nashville. Mary has 1,000 people who work for her. She's looking at, did the agent solve the problem? How was the experience so quality? But also in app and during the drive, she's asking for feedback from the customer. Because we've all had the experience where we get into an Uber or Lyft and we wonder, is this driver taking the best route or just trying to make more money and drive faster? So they're, they're taking the guesswork out of that by asking for mid-drive feedback. And Lyft has done so many things to continue to be innovative. They've invested in self-driving cars and bike companies and on and on and on with investments and also focuses on hiring and training good people. They're involved in this discussion of the future city of transportation, of congestion in cities. And so it is not just I'm a ride-sharing company. It's an attitude that they have and it affects everything they do. And they've they're one of the world's most innovative companies, according to Fast Company. And so, really in closing, I want you to think about the service you provide to a customer. I believe that it is in the moments that matter to the customer that we truly have this amazing opportunity to step up and be there for the customer at the point of need, because we often don't. Think of the insurance industry. 2017 was the huge year of loss for the insurance industry because of natural disasters. And a lot of these insurance companies just couldn't take the sheer call volume. And so they had to outsource it. And as a result, it wasn't handled as beautifully. And so we had the worst year on record as well for customer satisfaction in the insurance industry. The phone matters. When things go bad, when you get in a car accident, you are getting on the phone. And so it's this incredible moment where are we going to be there for the customer or are we not? Are we going to put technology between ourselves and our customers that we know isn't a good experience? Or are we going to provide technology that works plus a human that can fix it easily when something goes bad? And so I want you to think of a few items from this talk today and take them home with you so you can think about reimagining your own customer experience. I talked about using this do more framework you're going to get after my speech and go through it and, and outline and meet with your colleagues and say, what is our employee experience? How are we using technology to innovate? I also encourage you to spend a day working in the contact center because there's so much value in understand what is going on on the front lines and talking to your people, because they know. And think about this idea of empathy. With your empathy hat on, go through your customer journey and figure out what is our customer journey actually like? How does it feel like to be a customer? And is this an experience that I personally would want? And so it's really been fun talking with you today. I hope I've inspired at least one idea that you can take home with you to do better, to do more. And I'm looking forward to meeting you now at the book signing. Thank you so much.